bit of history, um, and they're both intertwined with the start of the winery. Um, uh, I bought the piece of property that we today refer to as our estate vineyard in uh, the Fort Ross Seaview Appalachian in the latter part of 1995. So remember, Fela started in 1998. So before the winery started, uh, this was the sort of kernel that got it going. I was, uh, I was working for Helen Turley at the time. I was actually also working for Larry Turley at the time. And um, the, the course of events that occurred that got me to buy this ranch was the first harvest of the Marcusan Estate Vineyard came in. It was very tiny. And the grapes were taken to the Turley wine cellars, to Larry Turley's winery, and uh, uh, and produced into wine. And probably about three weeks after we had harvested, the Chardonnay was fermenting in barrel, and I tried it. And um, for those of you that have heard me say this before, it's something that I, I do refer to. I, mean, my, I grew up, my mom was a real estate broker, and when I tried that wine, and, and I said to myself, when this gets into the public psyche, people like me won't be able to afford land in this neighborhood. I should act right now. So I called a realtor and I said, can you show me everything that's available in say a five mile radius of this spot? And um, so it's important to go back and think about what this spot is. And, and you're talking about about 10 miles north of where the Russian River Valley spills out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, Coastline that's comparable to the Big Sur coast, if you have that in your mind, it's very radical. You go from the water to almost 2,000 plus feet of elevation very rapidly, cliff type scenario. And um, uh, very rugged. Uh, it's the, the San Andreas Fault is the causal agent for all of the extreme up and down that goes on there. It's geologically incredibly diverse because of the uplifting and then weathering that goes on. Uh, it's technically a temperate rainforest. We frequently get over 100 inches of rain a year. And the amount of plantable land versus total surface area is microscopic because basically the only places you can plant are ridge tops. So we are fortunate enough to have a ridge top that's about oh, two and a two and a half miles as the crow flies from the Pacific. Uh, our elevation's about 1,400 feet. Uh, as I said, I bought the ranch in 95 and began borrowing equipment from my then employer, the good Dr. Larry Turley, and uh, working on getting some vines in the ground. We eventually finally got our first vines in the ground in 1997 and have been farming it ever since. We, uh, uh, as many of you know, grow Syrah, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. We chose to focus on Pinot today. Uh, we will have the, the, uh, the other two varieties will be subject to future tastings uh, of this ilk. Um, so uh, the soil that the Pinot Noir is planted in is actually relatively classic. Um, uh, there's two classics there. We have Gold Ridge Loam, which is a classic West County soil. Um, and Gold Ridge Loam is a degraded uh, marine floor with some clay in it. So it's well drained, but it has a little bit of water holding capacity. Um, and then we have a Laughlin series, which is a much more angular, rocky, sort of forbidding looking soil, if you will. Um, and uh, the, the ranch is interesting in as much as we are the first people to grow grapes on it. Um, it was a redwood forest for, I'm probably bad on math, but several million years anyway. Um, at some point, <clears throat> we started logging, not me, but we as a collective society started logging the North Coast. Uh, that logging accelerated after the earthquake and fires in San Francisco in 1906. And behind logging came ranching, uh, sheep and cattle, and then came me. And so uh, relatively virgin soil. Um, we have farmed it organically since its inception. And uh, in fact, are now in the process of transitioning to biodynamic farming. Um, uh, 
from a vintage standpoint, just to think about what we're, we're looking at, we wanted to go back far enough to give some uh, inkling as to how our wines age and how they begin to shed their baby fat and their Californianness, if you will, and uh, you know, reveal a little more of the site, uh, which has been my experience over time. You, you growing grapes in the climate that we do, I think sometimes the wines in their youth are, I mean, they're not unpleasant, they are very Californian. And for a lot of people, the wine is gone before they get to see this other side. So that's kind of part of the fun of the exercise of, of diving into the cellar. Um, so we're looking at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, six vintages. A pretty fascinating arc of vintages from rainy falls to droughty falls to from big yields to little yields. So we kind of cover a lot of bases here. And I mean, if I can give it to you in a sort of snapshot from my memory, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, so 2010 was a year that was actually quite cold and it had an event in, uh, I want to say it was late August, if not early September, where it was cold. People that were, um, people that are very good farmers, I think tend to ameliorate a lot of the issues of the vintage and 10 is a great example. So if you were a farmer that was conscientious in 10 and you were doing all of your canopy management, because let's say you're organic and you need to do that in order to not have rot in your vineyard, then you didn't experience the problem that a lot of other people did, which was, it was a decent sized crop. It was very cold. People very late in the season started to get worried about sunshine on their grapes and they pulled a lot of leaves. And then we had a big heat burst and it burned a lot of things. Um, for us, the way we farm, our general belief is grapes are a lot like humans. I would rather, take somebody that hasn't been out in the sun in June and expose them to a little bit of sun and get them acclimatized to it, then I would take that person out for the first time in August and expose them to the August sun. So if you leaf thin early, which we do, because for us that's about um, getting spray penetration into the canopy, uh, we farm organically, we don't have the benefit of synthetic fungicides. Um, so our vineyards were exposed throughout the year. That develops a, a thickening of the skins. And when we have a heat wave, we don't really worry about it. We also, we also don't strip leaves completely. We more selectively take off laterals and lower hanging leaves and still allow sort of dappled sunlight, if you will, in the fruit zone. Um, but 10 was definitely marked by that event. I think psychologically, a lot of vintners will say, oh, I remember 10. Of, um, lost a bunch of fruit. Um, I remember 10 because it was a really cool growing season. Um, much like 11, 11, however, had the unusual uh, marker of ending with rain, which we actually don't get in California that much. And it, it, uh, it was the rainiest fall that I can remember. And it reminded me a lot of Europe or Oregon where there are periodic rains throughout harvest. And so um, the intriguing comparison between 10 and 11, I think, in the wine is um, both cool years. 10 was actually cooler than 11 in a lot of sites. Um, 11 had rain, periodic rain at the end, and then a lot of rain. Um, you will find it, it, the refrain when, when I talk about Fela is, you know, we make wines that are relatively um, you know, modest in alcohol. They're not, they're not big bruisers. And so we tend to pick a little earlier than someone, let's say, that's making a 15% alcohol wine. If we're targeting a 13 or whatever, our, our, we don't really have a target. For me, it's sort of you look at the vineyard and the vineyard is pretty good at letting you know when it's time to pick. Um, uh, so that being said, a lot of those late season issues in even 2011 were not that much of an issue for us. Um, so 
11 was a much smaller crop than 10. It, had it been a big crop, it would have been an incredibly late vintage. So that's another factor. So you're, when you look at the two of them, they were both late. 11 was a smaller crop than 10. Uh, 10 was a warmer year than 11. You know, you're, you're, you're splitting hairs, so you've got those types of vintages, the cool vintages. And then you roll into uh, 12 and 13. And 12 and 13 are sort of the, they're the classic California. They're the, they're the, they're the Goldilocks vintage. It's the, it's the part of California that Europeans, you know, on the one hand, wish they had, and on the other hand, despise. Um, we had great fruit set. It was ample sunshine, good size crop, you know, normal ripening, I would say, patterns, um, and uh, classics, classic California wines. When you then get into the next two, and it's kind of intriguing that they set up this way, and I hadn't really thought of it until I'm sitting here talking about it, you get into the next two vintages, 14 and 15, and what you then find is the beginnings of the effect of drought. You really start to see it in 14 with the harvest advancing radically. That was the first year of we're picking in August. Not all of these. Um, Kiefer was a September pick, but it was an early September pick versus say 10 and 11, which were, uh, 10 was a mid-October pick at Kiefer, 11 was a early October pick, Juxtapose that to uh, 12 and 13 at Kiefer are, say, third week of September, which is was a more classic time frame for, the, for that part of the world. Um, and then you get into 14 and 15, and you're into August. And that's a combination of volume, which was lower in 14 and phenomenally low in 15, that is yield, and the beginnings of a drought. Um, or the effects of drought, I should say, um, and the, as it prolonged, the, the, the ripening cycle shortened and shortened and shortened. So you have that, um, th th that's your vintage overlay. Um, obviously, the estate vineyard integral to what we were doing. Kiefer, on the other hand, um, I met Marcy Kiefer right after I started making wine for Fela. Uh, she was very good friends with a couple, Al and Virginia Rago, who owned the Que Sera Vineyard. They brought her to taste that wine. We entered into a conversation which resulted in Fela buying Chardonnay and Pinot from Marcy starting in 2000, our first, uh, so that would be our first single vineyard, uh, Chardonnays, uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So it goes way back. Um, uh, that relationship continued until Marcy's death, uh, which was now two years ago. Um, a really special place for me from a business standpoint, from a personal standpoint, um, and just a great site. Um, late, cool, uh, in incredible wine in the wines. Um, just they've got this tension that will carry them for a very long time. I uh, uh, have been known to recount the story of a, a, a winemaker dinner I did uh, a number of years ago, and um, uh, it was a, an eight top, and so I just needed a bottle. And my friend said, hey, bring something old from your cellar. And I had one bottle of 2000 Kiefer, and I brought it. And uh, right as we were sitting down, uh, he whispered in my ear, did you try this wine before you brought it? And I thought, you know, I was thinking maybe a 15-year-old Chardonnay probably isn't a great idea. It's bad, right? And he said, oh, no. I never, if you gave me a hundred guesses, I wouldn't have said this was domestic Chardonnay. Are you kidding me? And I tried it and was like, yeah, I probably wouldn't have guessed that either. Um, so this wine has phenomenal aging capacity. I mean, the reality of wine in America is most people don't age California Chardonnay very long. And I think this wine delivers tremendous pleasure early on. However, that's why I've kept this in my library because I'm fascinated by it. And um, I uh, think you will be too. So that being said, enjoy. And I'll wait to talk to you till next week.